Hi, and welcome to the Ministry Network Podcast. I'm your host, James Baird. Today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Derek Thomas. Dr. Thomas is the Senior Minister of First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. He's also the Chancellor's Professor of Systematic and Pastoral Theology at Reformed Theological Seminary. In this episode, we'll talk with Dr. Thomas about everything from his favorite books to the Puritans and the current pandemic. The Ministry Network podcast is sponsored by Westminster Theological Seminary. To learn more about their new online offerings, visit ministrynetwork.com forward slash degree. Now, let's talk with Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas, what are some of your favorite Puritan books and why? Well, they're favorites because they meant a great deal to me at certain points in my life. And so John Newton's letters meant something to me because John Newton was an extraordinary preacher, but he was also a great pastor and ministered to his congregation and further afield through letters, you know, letters to widows and those dealing with disease and those dealing with melancholy and those dealing with besetting sins and a hundred other things. And the way in which Newton wrote and dealt with them so lovingly and caringly was a very considerable help to me at one point. Early on in my ministry, in my Christian life, uh, when I was still a college student, I lived in, in the top flat apartment of Jeff Thomas's manse, along with his wife and children, and he would get up early at four o'clock in the morning and he would make coffee and we would read John Owen to each other. Now, I am, I am not a morning person. I wasn't then and I'm not now. So it was a considerable struggle for me. And added to that was the prolixity of John Owen's writing because he thought, I think, in Latin and translated into English. And I remember going through volume seven on the duty Uh, of being spiritually minded based on some verses in Romans chapter 8. And it introduced me to John Owen and then later reading more and being urged to read more by Sinclair Ferguson and then eventually teaching a course at RTS in Jackson on John Owen, which got me a little more. I'm not an Owen expert by any means at all, but John Owen's volume 6 on mortification and temptation is a profoundly life-changing read. In the last decade or so, I've been engaged in bringing into print with Joel Beakey and others the works of William Perkins. Uh, William Perkins is, is probably more important than John Owen, to be honest, but because most of his works were in Elizabethan English and some of them didn't even have complete sentences They were never republished, and so this is the first time, I think next year will be the first time that all 10 of his volumes will be in print for the first time, and it is truly magnificent. Can you share with us some of the contours of the Puritans' approach to pastoral ministry? Yes, well, of course, uh, Richard Baxter's uh, reformed pastor, you know, has been a mainstay as a Puritan expression of pastoral ministry. And I think the Banner of Truth brought out a more readable version of it called, I think, Pastoral Ministry. And it was, it was designed to be read in like 30 or 31 days. And he talks about calling and preaching and visitation and church discipline and developing Christian virtues and patience and love and so on. And that's a profound piece of writing a precursor to the Puritans in Martin Bootser's book concerning the true care of souls, which the Baron of Truth republished and updated uh, just a few years ago. And that's a very important piece too. But, I mean, their approach to pastoral ministry was twofold, I think. I mean, it obviously included preaching and teaching. And in their preaching and teaching, they did pastoral ministry. They engaged experientially in the needs of the congregation. I think that they saw, as the Directory for Public Worship indicates so clearly, and they were Puritans, of course, the Westminster Divines, 
in that they divided the congregation into various sections. I mean, the unconverted, the hardened, those who were near the kingdom of God, those who were young converts, those who were older converts. And each one sees things and hears things differently. Those struggling with sin and so on. And so in the congregation, you have, you, you know, you can categorize maybe 10 to 15 different types of people. And they're all on different pages and, and needing to hear different things. And I think that has been a very insightful thing for me in preaching, that not only do you need to exegete the scriptures, but you also need to exegete the audience, the people that are listening to you. And what is it that they are hearing whenever you're saying this? I mean, some people are hearing legalism, some people are hearing antinomianism. And that's because they're coming from different perspectives, and you need to be aware of that and address both of them. M maybe not always, but the Puritans also had a very profound sense of the need to visit in homes, and, and something that is almost entirely passé now. We live in an age where it's almost impossible to simply knock on the door and say, I'm the minister, can I come in? I mean, here in the South, the uh, painters and decorators to come before the senior minister calls at the house. But you do need to be inventive in the way that you minister to people and reach out to people and text them and, and email them and call them and, and so on. How has your, this question is a bit off script, how has your pastoral or your ministry team approached caring for the congregation in light of the current pandemic? Well, that's a very, very difficult question. So what we did here was almost on day one, we had already ordered equipment for live streaming. We've been doing that for a long time, for a decade and more. But we also ordered extra cameras because we were going to be engaged in doing little videos for other things. But that came in very useful. So from day one, I have done a daily devotional, a video daily devotional. We have a fun Friday where I'm in the graveyard that surrounds our church and we have some members dress up as the character that's buried there and tell his life story. But that was a way of just communicating and typically a thousand views a week or so, maybe more, 1100 views a week. And, and I actually they're being viewed by people that aren't members of the church. But it, it's just a five minute thing. It's a means of communicating. And then all of our sections, ministry sections, are doing what every other church is doing. They're doing stuff online and putting out stuff in the music department, recording things and putting them online. We're, we're recording some things outside with a group of four or five singers, socially and more than socially distanced for singing. You know, Easter was a challenge. Mother's Day yesterday was a challenge. And I, I recorded a separate little piece for Mother's Day that folk could access during the course of the day. And then our pastoral care staff have been on the telephone and one of our ministers has been on the telephone 12, 13, 14 hours a day talking to whoever. The saddest part of this for us has been not being able to visit folk in hospital and not being able to visit COVID patients that we've had in hospital. And uh, we've had some challenges with funerals. I did a wedding yesterday, Saturday, outside with social distancing, and it wasn't the wedding that they had planned, for sure. And so those are some of the ways that we've been reaching out. And I, I said to the staff on the very first day, we had staff meeting after the first Sunday that we'd locked down, we want to come out of this having done too much rather than too little. Because these are things that people remember forever. There's nothing like this in their, in their experience and probably won't be again uh, in terms of church life. And, you know, 20 years from now, they'll, they'll be saying, you remember the time when the church locked down? And I want them to say, you know, and the church loved us through that and reached out to us through that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, speaking of the, the pandemic and the Puritans, I had a few minutes to talk to Dr. Ferguson about this. And one thing he said was how amazing it is that as the Puritans were ministering before germ theory and our understanding of how these things spread, the first thing they would have done is to visit everyone, accidentally creating a hotbed <laughs> in their church. And there's also the bravery. I know that in the 1660s, when the plague came to London before the Great Fire, 
it was the ejected Puritan ministers that stayed in London and all the others, most of the others left the city. So there was also a bravery and a courage about them. And, and we too, you know, may have to exercise some bravery and courage. But everything that we're doing right now is counterintuitive. We are pulling apart rather than coming together. You know, we've now got into the habit of sort of, if somebody's coming in my direction, you sort of step aside, you know, and all of that's counterintuitive. Well, shifting the subject slightly, who are some of your favorite modern preachers and why do you find them so effective? Well, Jeff Thomas, graduate of Westminster, he has been in my life for the totality of my Christian life in some form or another. He was formative for me as a college student, growing, searching, wanting to learn Reformed theology, wanting to know what ministry looked like. And I have been a poor communicator with him, but I get his weekly missive that he sends out. And I've been reading that for 40 years or more, 45 years or more. And Sinclair Ferguson, who I've known, also known for over 40 years. And for a great deal of that time, we spoke frequently every week or so. And more recently, we've communicated either by FaceTime or text messages. And as a young Christian, I was shaped by not just what he said, but the manner in which he said it. And I still find myself to this day saying something in a sermon off the top of my head, but it's Sinclair Ferguson's voice that I'm hearing when I say it, because there's something about the way that he thinks that resonates. You know, I, I read people. I mean, there are preachers that I listen to, and I, I haven't the faintest idea where they're going. And I, I don't follow the logic of the sentence structure. But there are other preachers that I listen to, and I think that absolutely, totally makes sense to me. And so there would be people like Garcia Sproul, who I was very honored to become a friend to. Steve Lawson, although his sermons are long. Steve, if you're ever listening to this, I always want to go before Steve Lawson in a conference, not after Steve Lawson. And, you know, John Piper, although I couldn't think like John Piper to save my life, and I couldn't preach like him to save my life, but he's totally unique. But I love listening to him. And Alistair Begg would be another preacher that I would love to spend a lot of time listening to and and have done to some extent. But more recently, I've had the privilege of having Ligon Duncan in my life and... Ralph Davis was the preacher here with me. Uh, He was the evening preacher for five years, and that was an incredible blessing. And no one preaches like Ralph Davis. And now I have Gabe Fleurer, who's young enough to be my son, but has become a very dear friend, a graduate again of Westminster Seminary, and preaches in a very different style from me, but I absolutely love listening to him on Sunday evenings. I'd like to rewind for a second and point out that It is so fun to imagine Derek Thomas and Sinclair Ferguson FaceTiming each other. (laughs) He FaceTimes me these days from the golf course. He's not actually playing golf. He's walking the golf course. So in Britain, they're only allowed one walk a day. I mean, that's that's how strict it has been. And so he walks around the golf course that's near his home. And typically, I walk with him along maybe four or five holes and every now and then he'll point out the view and it's central Scotland and it's absolutely breathtaking. That's amazing. What advice would you give a pastor struggling to preach Christ from the Old Testament? Yeah, this is a tricky one and I I don't want to spend an hour, but this is a really, really important and tricky subject and there are extremes on both sides that I think I'd want to try and avoid. I mean, I've heard the sermons that see Jesus under every rock and pebble, and they turn Old Testament history into something different. It's no longer history. It's a parable of some kind. It's a different genre of some kind. I I think that is just nuts. I do think that the driving force should be, you know, Luke 24, beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them the things concerning himself. Now, I'm not sure that Luke 24 is saying, that Jesus is in every verse of the Old Testament. Sometimes he is not there in the verse. He is the one telling you this. 
you know, the command to love your neighbor, he's not there in the verse, but he's the one telling you to love your neighbor. But again, I was hugely influenced when I was thinking through all this stuff, was it 10 years ago or more, when Sinclair gave a paper, I think, at one of John Piper's conferences about preaching Christ from the Old Testament, and where he drew those principles that you need to see about promise and fulfillment, type and anti-type, covenant and Christ, sort of proleptic anticipation and fulfillment, and so on. And for me, putting that in simpler language is, that there are always, especially in historical narrative, there are two perspectives. And one is the 36,000 feet looking down and you can see the horizons at both ends. And, and so you can make the journey from Genesis 3.15 to Bethlehem. And that's one theme, the progress of God's redemptive purposes. But there's also a microcosmic view that you have to actually get down into the lives of people people with personalities and explore those personalities. And it's not, it's not moralism, right, to say, don't be, you know, don't be like this person, but be like that person. It's not necessarily moralism to say that. There are instructive lessons for good and evil to be learned from the lives of people. And perhaps the first thing to see is not Jesus. Maybe that's the overall picture to see in the story of Ruth and so on, and Boaz. I mean, there there are intricate issues of their lives and personalities and sorrows and griefs and providences and a love story that needs to be explored. But at the end of the day, there's a God of providence that ensures that through Ruth and Boaz, King David eventually will be born and eventually the son of David Jesus comes. So there's a macro and a microcosmic angle to look at. That's so helpful. Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today on Ministry Network. It's been an absolute pleasure and it's wonderful to see you, James, but you do need a haircut. <laughs> well, I can't get out to get one. That's, that's true. That's true. Join us next time as we talk with Dr. Joel Beakey. In the meantime, You can visit ministrynetwork.com forward slash degree to learn about the new online offerings available at Westminster Theological Seminary.